You know, what's interesting about the conversation with Jolly is uh, she is from India. And she prayed for her neighbors who ended up being Muslim. And because of her life experience and her journey, she was given an open door, an opportunity to witness to her neighbors. She's doing international missions on her own street. You can do the same thing. It's just a matter of prayerfully opening your heart and your life to those people that you see every day going into their mailbox or just around and see what the God will do in the beginning of your conversation with your friends who may not know who Jesus is. Stephen Sondheim was probably the greatest writer of American musical theater in the history of Broadway. Uh, a lot of songs that you sing out of Broadway shows, a lot of those are Sondheim, are, are Sondheim songs. Um, Sitting in the Clowns. That's Stephen Sondheim from a, a musical called A Little Night Music. One of his more famous musicals is a show called Company. It's about a young man who's about 35 years old who is trying to figure out if he's going to fall in love, make the commitment to a relationship, or spend the rest of his life alone. And he has five other couples that he interacts uh, with who are in various stages of their own marriage. Some encourage him, some discourage him. Some break his heart. Others give him hope. At the critical moment of the theater, Robert, the main character, sings a song called Being Alive. It starts with a complaint. What do you get when you fall in love? And the words go like this. Someone who needs you too much someone who holds you too close, someone to draw you up short, someone to mess with your sleep. At the end of the song, the words change from complaint to plea. Somebody need me too much. Somebody hold me too close. Somebody draw me up short and mess with my sleep and make me aware of being alive. Because being alone isn't being alive. Being alone isn't being alive. This topic of loneliness has taken on a new depth in our culture. With the pandemic and all of us being forced to stay home and all of us being ripped out of our normal routines, not being able to go to school, not being able to go to the office, how close we can stand to each other. A lot of us found ourselves in a very frustrating, if not deadly, isolation. Addictions went through the roof. Alcohol sales broke all records. Suicides and threats of suicide overwhelmed our social care systems. There is something about being in relationship that is critical to our well-being, that is critical to us being us. We need people to need us. We want people 
to want us. We want somebody to know our name. I've told you before, we can always tell when someone calls my office if they know me or not. If someone asks for Dr. Glenn, they don't know me. If someone is calling for Pastor Glenn, they don't know me. If someone calls for Mike, probably know me. If somebody says Michael, that's family. <laughs> you want somebody to know your name, don't you? to know who you really are. The Christmas story is the time when you and I gather together and shake our heads in disbelief that God has taken the risk of telling us his name. It's a story as old as humanity itself. And we're going to pick just one of those stories. In fact, it goes all the way back to Genesis 45. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. We're going to pick up toward the end of the story of Joseph, and I'll give you the back story on it in just a minute. Now, Joseph could no longer keep his composure in front of his attendants, so he called out, send everyone away from me. No one was with him when he revealed his identity to his brothers. But he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and Pharaoh's household heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But they could not answer him because they were terrified in his presence. His name is Jesus. And the world cannot answer because we're terrified in his presence. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. You know how important names are. And what a risk you took when you gave us yours. How frightening it is when you ask for ours. So we pray, dear Lord Jesus, that this would be a moment when we, your children, would know your name and you would know ours. We pray this in your name. Amen. As you know, we go off and spend a week, all the pastors and the preaching team of Brentwood Baptist Church and all of our campuses, and we plan out the sermons a year in advance. Once we get those big rocks in the jar, we assign sections to other pastors who will plan those sections, come back, and we'll exchange uh, this preparation, and that's how we put the sermon plan together for the year. Uh, most of the time, it's, hey, this is a good idea, da, 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 and we don't think about what it's going to look like when we actually get there. So we went over this Advent series several months ago. Yes, Advent, nice, Christmas, da 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 can't go wrong preaching the Christmas story. And then we get to it, and we've got the story of Joseph. What were you thinking? How in the world are we going to get baby Jesus in this story of Joseph because, you know, if they show up in December and don't hear baby Jesus, your people are going to freak. Then you start breaking the story down. Now, remember the story. Joseph was one of Jacob's many sons. And Jacob loved Joseph because Joseph was the, wife, was the son of his favorite wife. He treated Joseph differently. Joseph got a coat of many colors, or uh, another translation is a coat with, sh uh, with long sleeves, which meant that Joseph was not going to do any chores. 
because if you're going to be working, then you would have a coat with short sleeves that didn't get in the way of grabbing the, 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 ag the grain and that kind of stuff, dealing with the sheep. But the long sleeves meant that Joseph was not to do any chores. You know how well that went across. And Joseph showed up one day, and that was just the moment that where the, the, the straw literally hit the camel's back, and the brothers said, that's it, let's kill him. One of the brothers said, no, let's not kill him, let's throw him in a well. And they threw him in a well, a dry well, and they left him there. Now, when I taught this series at Kairos several years ago, this was the most exciting moment because I had a lot of those kids at Kairos want to throw their brothers and sisters in wells and wanted to know where they could do that. A couple of the brothers had a better idea. Let's just not leave him here to rot. Let's sell him. And so the last picture they have of Joseph is him being tied up as a slave, being drugged off in a slave caravan. Joseph is sold to an Egyptian officer named Potiphar. Potiphar's wife makes an advance on Joseph. Joseph refuses. Joseph is thrown in prison, and there he languishes. Pharaoh has a series of dreams that only Joseph can interpret, and Joseph interprets those dreams and is given power and authority in Egypt because he is a seer. Under Joseph's leadership, Egypt prepares for the famine that rocks that part of the world. And lo and behold, Egypt is the only place with food, and Joseph's brothers, the very ones who sold him into slavery, show up to buy food. And Joseph can barely contain himself. Now, this time, he is fully assimilated into the Egyptian culture. He's given an Egyptian name. He speaks Egyptian. He looks Egyptian. Everything about him is Egyptian. The brothers do not recognize him. In a series of tests, he messes with the brothers and tests the brothers. And finally, when he realizes that maybe things have changed a little bit in their lives, he tells them, I am Joseph. They couldn't believe him. Later in the story, he says, look at my brother Benjamin's eyes and look at my eyes and you'll know we are the same. I am Joseph. I'm not Egyptian. I'm not who Pharaoh thinks I am. I am your brother. I am our father's son. This is who I really am. I am Joseph. What we would give to be loved for who we are I met a young country star whose name you would know when he was still in college. He couldn't get a date in Nashville. When he told girls he was a musician, they dropped him like a hot rock. No future here. Well, he did have a future. He was over at my house one night bemoaning his love life. I looked at him, I said, would you give me a break? You've got hit records, you've got money hand over fist. What in the world are you complaining about? I'll never forget his answer. Nobody loves me. They all love the star but nobody loves me. If you're not careful, Christmas can be one of the loneliest days of your life. And it's lonely because by this time of the year, we are exhausted with playing the games. We can't pretend anymore. We can't fake it anymore. 
And we've written in our journals a thousand times just over the last few days, next year is going to be different. But we're scared. Scared if we tell our friends the truth. Scared if we tell our family the truth. Scared if we tell anybody the truth. If we have that moment where we step out and say, this is who I am, this is me, I am Joseph, that we will be abandoned. In that beautiful chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes about the beauty of love, but at the end, in verse 12, there is this moment that is hidden in the text. Do you remember it? Now we see through a glass darkly, as with a mirror. Then we will see face to face. I will know as I am known. Do you realize how many stories we have of Jesus that began with Jesus asking somebody their name? Who are you? This is me. With all my faults, all my failures, all my hopes, all my dreams, this is me. And imagine our surprise when God says, my name is is Jesus. My name is Jesus. One great theologian said God took an incredible risk by telling us his name and he hasn't had a moment's peace since. Because there's something that happens when somebody calls your name. You can't help but turn around. Uh, you know, they did a study on this. Now, who does this? I don't know. But they did a study on what wakes people up. The answer, after all this federal money, <laughs> your name. If somebody calls your name, you will wake up out of sleep. Now, I don't know about you, but in 1956, the year I was born, every other male child was named Mike. I can be anywhere, and somebody yell, Mike, I turn as if I'm the only Mike in the world something about your name you can't help but hear it you can't help but know Christmas is the time when you and I come to the manger stand next to the shepherds and everybody else and we lean in to the baby Jesus and say, my name is Michael. And Joseph will say to you, his name is Jesus. A long time ago, there was a television program called MASH. You may remember it. It was about a hospital unit in the Korean War. A little fellow by the name of Radar O'Reilly was the company clerk. He was the one who kept everything in order. He is the naive character of the group, the child of the innocent. sleeps with a teddy bear. One night, a pilot shows up in the mass unit in the hospital who claims to be Jesus Christ. Of course, nobody believes he's Jesus, but there are enough quirky moments that happen that cause everybody to doubt, well, maybe, I don't know, this guy might be. 
They're getting ready to send the pilot to the big hospital in Seoul, Korea, when radar runs up to the back of the van and holds out his teddy bear to the pilot who thinks he's Jesus. Sir, will you bless my teddy bear? And the pilot who thinks he's Jesus does. And then, in one of the most moving moments of the show, the pilot puts his hands on radar and says, bless you too, radar. And radar pulls his hat off and bows his head. And he says, my name is Walter. You say your name as confession. This is who I am. Jesus speaks your name as blessing. This is who you are. My child, my son, my daughter, I know your name, and you know mine. So, we gather together as family, brothers and sisters all, and we light this Advent candle. And the light of this little candle pushes back the darkness, and around it we can see the smile of everyone who gathers. (laughs) Why wouldn't we smile? We know God's name. His name is Jesus. Why don't you pray with me? I know some of you came because your spouse asked you to come at Christmas time. I know some of you came out of habit. I know some of you came out of a deep sense of brokenness. You can't take another year like this. And however you came and why you came, here's what matters to us. In this moment of Christmas, God has told us his name. And if you call that name, he will answer. And in this moment, you can tell him your name, everything about you. And you can let go of the past and grab hold of his future. And I know I'm saying a whole lot and a handful of words. Listen, that's why I'm going to the Welcome Center. It's the glass room doors you'll see there go out turn left you'll find us i'm standing right there i'll be there counselors will be there pastors will be there we want to answer your questions we want to talk with you we want to have a conversation with you we don't want you to leave this moment not knowing the name of god and making sure he knows you so you find us don't leave with those questions unanswered you want to be part of brentwood baptist church we're waiting on you however the lord has come to you now he's waiting for you where you are The church will wait for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open, every heart. So we pray the choices we make now are exactly what you want. 